Muito bem, boa tarde. Esse é o terceiro minicurso e a última aula do professor Uri Asher. Please, professor Asher. Welcome. Obrigado, Antonio. So, indeed, uh, this is the fourth and last uh, lecture in this uh, mini course. And uh, for it, I uh, wanted to switch gears in some sense. Uh, in another sense, not really, because uh, there is some overlap between uh, this talk in, and the first one from last Tuesday. So, there will be a test of your memory at some point uh, in, this, uh, in this lecture. Um, but what I, but the, the difference between this talk and the, and the rest is that it is a talk. Uh, I gave uh, a talk like this uh, uh, two, three times in uh, workshops and conferences this past year uh, with the difference that usually I have 25 minutes or at best 50, whereas now I have an hour and 20 minutes. And so uh, uh, there's more time, and I had to choose between uh, being slower or uh, adding more material. And I'll let you figure out how, what I chose. The, the essence of, uh, of, of, today, of today's uh, lecture is um, uh, more philosophical, in a sense, not to say psychological or social, just philosophical. And, uh, and I want to investigate the, the uh, interface between two communities. One community is the community of uh, scientific computing, numerical analysis, uh, ma applied mathematics. Uh, and I think most people here are from that community. And the other community is uh, visual computing, which, uh, by which I mean a combination of uh, computer graphics and image processing. And uh, I want to touch upon points or, or situations where, uh, where one community can contribute to the other community. And I really mean it in both directions. So it's not like uh, one of the communities uh, has some supreme knowledge that eventually, you know, every once in a while it uh, sort of uh, gives the other. But rather, uh, I believe that there are situations where each community uh, has a better knowledge uh, of something than the other, and therefore, it's worthwhile to know, because we can benefit from it in both ways. So, uh, I'm going to do that in, in, in form of, of looking at case studies. And in particular, I'm going to concentrate on the th th second and third. The first one are two examples just to kind of start to start to kind of get to where, uh, where I'm going. Uh, and uh, just to, to say that visual computing is, is uh, a term, for me, it's relatively recent, but there are actually big labs around the world and departments even uh, of visual computing. Uh, and and uh, in, in some essential way, it is different than numer the numerical analysis that we uh, are used to in the sense that you don't uh, iterate or, or, or solve up to some convergence uh, criterion uh, that has to do with tolerance or anything like that. In fact, coming back to the lecture of, uh, of last Tuesday. Uh, but rather, uh, if it looks good, then it is good to some extent, to some extent. And uh, this, the example that I have, I even have uh, this example in a book I wrote. Uh, is you have a, a carpet uh, on the floor and you, you accidentally touch it and so now there's a ripple on the carpet. You can see the ripple right away. But if you think about it as an error, uh, this, the height over the floor, the, the only place where it's above the floor is the ripple and so the, uh, in the L1 norm there's, there's a very small error and yet you see it right away. So there's a difference of, per, of perception here of, uh, of some quality, if you wish. Let me give you uh, two examples, uh, kind of more technical than what I've just described. So uh, here they are, two examples to start. And uh, here's an example uh, of cloth simulation. As I said, the first uh, lecture that I gave here comes back to life. And so here is a piece of cloth. And you want the same manner as of two weeks, two weeks ago. And you want uh, to simulate how it's moving. And, uh, and so the equations of motion 
uh, uh, are that masses times accelerations of nodes or particles uh, is equal to a, an assembly of forces. And uh, we are going to use a mass spring system for this, which means that uh, you have uh, particles and in between, the, they have masses and, uh, and you have uh, springs connecting them in different ways to describe different forces that occur and so on, okay? Uh, mass spring system. And, uh, and uh, you have elastic forces, ELS stands for elastic, and, uh, and they are, they have, there are three types of elastic forces. One is stretching, the other one is bending, and the third one is shearing, okay? The bending and the shearing are not very stiff, but the stretching is stiff. So there's a stiff uh, component to the differential equation there, and it's a highly oscillatory type of stiffness uh, because it's a second derivative of... Uh, yeah. Uh, but the thing is that you don't see, when I go like that, you don't see any uh, high oscillation. Okay, so the, the oscillation is there somehow, but it is damped away. So uh, we want to take advantage of that. So uh, uh, Braff and Witkin in 98, uh, in a paper in Seagraph, a graphics paper, uh, uh, said let's simulate with large tape size and let's uh, use uh, semi-implicit backward Euler. That is backward Euler method, which is, uh, so, so you have time. There is time. And now we are in step t uh, Tn and we take a large step to Tn plus one. Okay. Here we know the uh, positions and the velocities of the of uh, the particles, and here we want to find, uh, let's say, v n plus one, from which we are going to get also q n plus one, because q n plus one uh, is just a derivative. Uh, the deri v is just a derivative of q. Okay. So, so we want to get from here to here somehow, and. Um, And so uh, uh, this, this method here is, is a semi-implicit means, meaning we have to solve a system of uh, linear equations ax equal b at each time step. And uh, the x here is the velocity at n plus one, okay? Uh, but, uh, but when you solve linear equations, it's always ax equal b, and x is what we want to find, so let's use the usual notation. Okay, and they proposed for this uh, a preconditioned conjugate gradient, but modified, modified method. Why modified? Because uh, when you have some cloth moving, some of it, uh, you know, the, th the thing that is attached to my hand moved beca moves because I'm moving my hand. The rest of it moves according to Newton's law, but, but that guy doesn't, okay? There's a famous, uh, very famous uh, picture of Marilyn Monroe. She lived a long time ago. Uh, and her most famous picture, in fact, is uh, where uh, there, there's a whiff of wind coming from the subway in New York, and uh, her dress sort of goes up, and, uh, and she bends a little bit, you know, to make sure it doesn't go up too much. And, uh, and that's kind of, you know, a classical picture. So the, part, the lower part of the dress are particles that move according to Newton's law, but uh, the strap of her, of her shoulder, that moves because she moves her shoulder. It's constrained motion. Yeah. So, so what they did, uh, what they said was, well, we're going to define uh, filters for each, for each particle. Each particle is a three, by three, is a three vector. And uh, a filter SI, which is three by three, and really uh, we want to apply the, the conjugate gradient method to SAX equal SB, where S is a diagonal matrix of this tri uh, three by three blocks, okay? Uh, and uh, and uh, what we did uh, with Boxerman um, was to say, uh, we want to understand that uh, because the algorithm was given there in a way that, that it was useful to try to understand it. And uh, so we said, well, wait a minute, this S is an orthogonal projection. So we're going to write, uh, if we write Sx, uh, let's call it u and i minus S, the x, if w, then u and w are orthogonal, not just n, u, and v, they are orthogonal, in fact. 
And so that allows you to, uh, to just, it doesn't matter, the, the details don't matter so much, but basically you have this uh, system that you want to apply the conjugate gradient method modified to, whereas the rest, the other part of the X is really given, Z, Z is a given, the movement of the shoulder of Marilyn, right? I mean, so it's given, you understand? Yeah. So only this, the X appears only, uh, the, the, the equations appear only here. So, so we put it like that, and then we prove the theorem. And in order to prove the theorem uh, that, uh, of convergence, we had to assume that the initial uh, value for the conjugate gradient method looked like this. It's s times, the pre for example, the previous one, plus i minus s times z, where the z is, again, the movement of the shoulder, the, the given constraint. One. Whereas uh, Baraf and Witkin suggested this sort of uh, initial uh, start for the conjugate gradient method. It turned out that in order to, we, we assumed it in order to, to, for the proof, but then we tried it and, it, and we got actually a gain of uh, significant gain in, 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 uh, in uh, speed. Uh, that is uh, somehow from, by, by proving the theorem, suddenly also the method Im improved because we understood it better. So in, in some way, we are in that way contributing to what was there before in computer graphics. So of course the next one is uh, the opposite example uh, in terms of the different communities. You know? so, uh, so there's a paper uh, that appeared in SIGGRAPH 2005 and they, uh, so Fetke was a professor, in, is a professor in Stanford and these were his great students at the time. And uh, so you have water, smoke, and thin deformable rigid shell, okay? All of them together and there is an interaction and there's an uh, interface that moves because the water hits it. All kinds of things that occur there. And you want to put it together in order to produce some um, uh, effect for the movie, for the movie industry, for instance. Pixar, in fact, they work for Pixar. So, um, and so they devised a multi-splitting method. So, so you have Navier-Stokes for the water, another Navier-Stokes for smoke, and, uh, and you have uh, also thin shell equations and all of them interact somehow. It's a mess. So uh, the way uh, you, you try to get out of anything out of it is uh, by a multi-splitting method. Basically, each part of the whole thing is introduced one at a time per time step. Okay. And uh, in fact, for the fluid stimulation itself, they did something, this is the description from the paper, we had vector the, sort of the velocity on the current time at TN, yeah, UN, and uh, add gravity, okay, and then uh, project it in order to get the next guy, okay, uh, by computer pressure uh, to enforce incompressibility, whatever that means. So what that means, in fact, is that there is a splitting just for the simulation of the water. That's what it means, okay. So let's get uh, closer to this. So here are the Navier-Stokes equations, the incompressible, here's the incompressible. So U and V are the components uh, of the velocity in, in X and, and Y direction. And uh, for, uh, this is for simplicity, just in two dimensions. P is pressure, nu is viscosity constant, okay? And this one says that, they, uh, that it is an incompressible flow Okay, the, the divergence of the velocity vector is zero. Okay, and P is like a Lagrange multiplier there, by the way. And, uh, and so, uh, it, we know how to deal with this part if it were alone, but it's not alone. Okay, so what we want is uh, to, uh, to, got, to get U and V out of these equations, but then uh, we have to get P uh, somewhere, uh, for, and, and P does not even appear in the remaining equation. So there's a well-known trick where, whereby you take a derivative, x derivative of the first equation here, y derivative of the second equation, and add them up. And uh, what that will do is uh, here you will say du dx t plus dv dy t, oh, that's zero. So this is drops that. This guy drops as well, okay? Uh, from here you have px x plus pyy, there it is. And uh, the rest which has not dropped. So up out pops an equation for P. So uh, this is a pressure equation for P. People called it the pressure Poisson equation, PPE. Okay. And now that you have done that, everybody with me? Uh, now that you have done that, 
okay? Then you can, uh, in fact, uh, say, okay, I'm going to use for p here, I'm going to use the value that I know at, at level n when I, compute when I compute velocities for n plus one. So at level n, we fix this, and we fix also the u and v in this uh, advection term. So now I have a linear advection equation, and we solve a linear advection, advection equation to obtain u and v at the next uh, time step. And then, substitute that on the, in the right-hand side of the pressure Poisson, Poisson equation to solve for the pressure, and that gives correction. Uh, that, 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 that brings back the condition of uh, incompressibility. Yeah, that's the step of a splitting method. So uh, one thing, by the way, the or so splitting methods usually like ala strong and things like that, Lee transformation and so on, usually you don't, uh, mathematicians don't say which one comes first. Here it's important that the advection comes first. Okay, otherwise it doesn't work. Uh, and, but, but the good news is you can use a semi-Lagrangian or a Lagrangian method uh, something very fast and uh, not limited by FCFL condition in the usual way. And uh, for the, for the, because you have isolated the advection part. And then uh, solve the Poisson equation, it turns out that this, in fact, is the most expensive part of the step. Some mathematicians say you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> Uh, because you've taken derivatives and you move to another suburb of space without telling anyone. Because in fact, uh, now you need uh, uh, boundary conditions on the pressure that you didn't have before. Okay, so uh, they would be unhappy with that. But uh, if you say, tell that, to, tell, try telling that to someone in computer graphics. I mean, they will not know what you're talking about. I mean, the method works. Uh, and so here's where there's a difference in the different communities, you see. So, of course, uh, you can say, you know, the only thing that is interesting is functional analysis, and therefore uh, I object to this, and uh, that's it. And, but, but then there's no interface between, with the other community. Okay. And in fact, um, uh, in fact, uh, this is a favorite method, and I would not know how to couple uh, smoke, water, and, uh, and uh, thin films without such a, <laughs> such a crime. So, so there is a difference here, and uh, in fact, the, the graphics community is telling us something here. Uh, the, 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 the difficulty, the, the incompleteness in some sense is in the boundary. The boundary can be away from the phenomenon that you're trying to, to look at or to, or to produce. And uh, when the result is supposed to, sh to, use, to be used for uh, special effects of movies, I mean, people get Oscars, te technical Oscars for things like that, you know? Uh, even if uh, in terms of uh, subway of space, there's something slightly non-kosher there. Interesting to notice, to note that, uh, that uh, so FedQ and so on, that's from 2005, they don't mention pressure Poisson equation. Uh, and they don't mention that uh, Gresham and Sonny wrote a, a whole book on it, in fact. Uh, somehow it's not well known. Uh, we used it ourselves in a paper that appeared in a, in a Brazilian journal. Uh, SBMAC, SBMAC, I don't know what it is. Uh -huh. Yeah, so, so, so the Computational and Applied Math of the Brazilian Society. Uh, and uh, this is where, I, by the way, I fell in love with Brazil in 94, and this was my, yeah. So um, uh, we used it, let, let me not get, uh, I'll be happy to tell you later why we used it. But we used it as well, but, but again, this is an example where you cannot be too rigid as a mathematician if you want to reach out to a community that tried that and finds that it works very well. If you think of, of, of solving, so, so, what people, so some people will say, well, you know, discretize the whole thing using a finite, uh, finite element method, uh, a conformal finite element method, and then uh, on the linear algebra, do your tricks, okay? But, but to do that, uh, the Poisson equation solver is not going to be the main cost. <laughs> you know, the whole thing will be much worse, much worse if you do a thing like that. So. Uh, uh, you get uh, quite nice results very rapidly if you, uh, if you uh, uh, do not obey all the mathematical rules 
too rigidly. These are just opening two examples to say that sometimes uh, uh, you can actually impress the other side if you wish, and some other times that maybe the other side can impress you. Now I'd like to go to the main two uh, uh, case studies that I, that, uh, that I mentioned. Uh, in case you haven't figured it for yourself, this is what I added because I have 180 minutes instead of only 60. Uh, and so now let's look at the part that usually I talk about, uh, usually, that I'm talking about now for the fourth time. Yeah. That doesn't make it usual. So, this is something that, uh, that we've uh, seen, no, that some of you have seen before because it was already uh, Tuesday, 10 days ago, uh, in, a, in the, lecture that, uh, the first lecture of this series. So uh, you're looking at a deformable body uh, or object, and such as uh, this shirt once again, or such as a pillow, or, or many, many others, such as a sizzling steak that you want to simulate. Uh, and, uh, and you want to, uh, to uh, simulate that so that the results look good. And moreover, you want to calibrate that. This is where the inverse problem, an inverse problem comes in. Uh, you want to calibrate that so that uh, you can simulate more confidently. Uh, uh, so calibration means both uh, finding Young's modulus and damping properties. And so uh, you have elastic dynamics equations, which are the same as the ones I showed you before, except that now it's going to be a finite element method that produces them. And, uh, and uh, the unknowns for the, uh, for the, for the inverse problems are, in, are parameters in those equations. Okay. And so the thing is that now you may want to do more. You may actually control and fabricate bo uh, flexible bodies. Okay, so it's not necessarily only for simulations such as uh, Mary Monroe's dress. Yeah. You, may, you may want to do something more uh, quantitatively. So uh, we semi-discretize, so uh, we have a system of PDEs here and some of it looks pretty horrible in fact. Uh, so it's in time and three space dimensions, but uh, what people do is they look at, uh, like usual finite elements in fact, you look at it at the variational level, discretize there, and, uh, and uh, obtain a system of ODEs as I mentioned before, and your mesh looks like this, so you have a mesh that is uh, consists of tetrahedra, okay, that discretizes the domain, and domain here is not very square. Um, and, and the other point is that this thing moves because you're tweaking the plant or because there's wind or because there's rain suddenly in the forest, yeah? So, so the plant moves, and so uh, the nodes of this uh, tetrahedral mesh move in time. Okay, so, so, so the whole domain moves, and that is one reason why uh, if you have to solve uh, nonlinear equations uh, from one step to the next, because it's an implicit discretization, then some difficulties arise because of this. Okay. Uh, this is the same plant uh, using fine, a fine surface mesh, and there is a method to, to uh, obtain a coarser volumetric mesh. Coarser because we are going to uh, simulate such a thing many times and so you don't want too many uh, unknowns there. And then uh, for the inverse problem, we, uh, we, uh, we take get data, so uh, use Kinect operators, not of operators, but rather uh, devices uh, to capture data tweak this plant a little bit, and so it's control, a controlled uh, disturbance, and obtain a bunch in time, so maybe this uh, connects to Samuli's next talk. Uh, in time, we get uh, point clouds, okay? A sequence of point clouds in time, okay? And so it's a, spa a space-time uh, uh, problem. And so from that, there is a motion tracking uh, procedure that via Simulating the motion of this guy here, uh, we get a, a coherent, uh, a coherent uh, uh, description of the of the plant in terms of a surface mesh. All of this was uh, in the first talk, so I'm sort of just going through it. Okay. 
and uh, and this problem can be really uh, uh, time consuming to put together. I mean, just the assembly of the equations at each step uh, is time, very time consuming, can take an hour or so of, com of computing just to assemble it. And, uh, and then to solve the inverse problem, you need to do, to do many simulations and so on. Fortunately, uh, for some applications at least, you can do a physics-based simulation, meaning uh, it, it looks good and therefore it's good. So uh, instead of having a tolerance, uh, you basically uh, observe that uh, the young modulus, they don't have to be too accurate because uh, even if the, the difference between what you compute uh, and for the inverse problem and the exact uh, young modulus is not small, it could be the simulation would be fine still. I did show examples like that uh, both uh, two days ago and last week. Yeah, with this um, electromagnetic uh, experiment. Yeah. And then, uh, because we don't see high oscillations when we move this piece of cloth around, yeah, uh, then, uh, then maybe we can take large steps that ignore the oscillation. Okay. And so, again, the same differential equations as before. Okay, this time I will, I'll spend another minute or two on them. So the elastic forces, there they are, and, uh, and they are given as the, uh, uh, the gradient of a, an elastic potential energy. This potential energy, uh, people like to believe it's quadratic, but there are uh, situations where it's not. And we basically, we just write exactly the same equation in terms of the velocities V and the positions Q. Uh, so it's a first order system now, uh, m, in, m moved from, from here to m inverse here, okay? So v is q dot and, uh, and here it says that masses times accelerations are equal to total for forces. And we write it as uh, the leading terms in this sort of sense, okay? So it's m inverse k and m inverse d, big D, uh, and uh, uh, times q and v plus the rest. Just, just, just highlight the important terms. And uh, when you take the, the Jacobian of the elastic force uh, with respect to Q, the, the, this is the tangent stiffness matrix at Q. If, the, if we started from a quadratic energy, then this would be a constant positive definite matrix, but for other forces, it is not constant. It's a, so you have nonlinearity in K, and in some situations, it's, the, it's not even positive definite. So we want the time step tau to be commensurate with the damped motion of the, piece of the cloth that I showed you. Uh, therefore, we cannot use an explicit Runge-Kutta discretization. Okay. And so implicit Runge-Kutta discretization, uh, but now you are hitting a nonlinear system. For moving, to, uh, for moving from Tn to Tn plus one, you have to solve a system of nonlinear equations, and that can be difficult to solve. And that's why these guys, in fact, uh, basically they said, let's use just one nonlinear uh, iteration uh, for backward Euler, and that is semi-implicit method, and uh, it's much faster. And that is the popular method to date in computer graphics, unless you really need high quality. But there is a heavy step size dependent damping, you see. And uh, how do you work with it? And how do you fabricate something where you, you use simulations that, that, that depend on the step size? Yeah. Why does it work at all, in fact? I mean, you have error here, errors here that are definitely order one. Okay. Uh, and so, before showing you that it works, uh, let me say that there is a whole bunch of methods that we can look at. Backward Euler and, and its semi-implicit variant, uh, they are highly damping, I will show. Uh, then there are methods that are not damping at all. For example, implicit midpoint, okay? Instead of uh, backward Euler, you do implicit midpoint, uh, and, and there are also methods that conserve energy or momentum. And then you can mix, you can mix the backward Euler with a method like this, uh, theta methods, a new work, generalized alpha, which engineers like. 
exponential time differencing, which we like. Uh, and uh, you can try to decouple fast and slow scales. I was going to talk about that on Tuesday, and I forgot, uh, I didn't get there. Uh, I, I, I will not talk about it today because there's another, other things. Just to mention what the methods are. So, so from here to here, from Tn to Tn plus one, we are moving with a step size tau, okay? And uh, backward Euler basically says, u at the next step is given by the u at the current step plus the step size times this right-hand side at the unknown level. Just for those who don't remember what it is. Okay. And uh, implicit midpoint says same thing, but instead of u at the unknown level, uh, a, um, an averaging of the known and the unknown. That's so this is a symmetric method. It's a conservative method. Whereas this guy is not conservative. And the, and the SI method is Newton, one Newton iteration for this. Now, uh, so, so it turns out that this method, uh, uh, to solve nonlinear equations with it is more difficult. This method, you have uh, high damping. So we are introducing another method, which is uh, in a paper that uh, was accepted for publication last week while, we, while, while I was talking. <laughs> um, and, uh, and here it is. So we write, first of all, the, different, the, the differential equation uh, at the step from Tn to Tn plus one uh, in integral form. So it's the exponent of uh, tau times the matrix J, the Jacobian matrix, uh, times Un plus the integral of the exponent here like so. Like so. And now, uh, we discretize in the integral, we sample j and u uh, at the known level n, like forward Euler, okay? Uh, now, once we have that, everything is constant except for the exponent, and so we can integrate it. We integrate it exactly and obtain a method that looks like this. The details are not so important, but we have a, f mate, mate, uh, f a function phi of the matrix Okay, which is uh, uh, z, z is a matrix, z inverse times the exponent of z minus one. So you have to uh, evaluate the exponential of a matrix. Uh, in fact, precisely this matrix. You have, you have to evaluate the exponent of tau times this matrix times some vector u. That's the next numerical task, how to evaluate that. There's a paper uh, by Moller and Van Loon, 19 dubious ways of, uh, of evaluating the exponential function. And 20 years later, they wrote another paper, and this, uh, the title was 19 dubious ways to evaluate the exponential function revisited. <laughs> this paper attracted a lot of attention. Uh, and in fact, there are, no, there are no best ways, but the one thing we have to remember here is that we want the exponent matrix times the vector. We don't want to ever see this matrix because A will be sparse, but the exponent of A will not be sparse. So, so you have a huge matrix that you don't want to see. You only want to see the result of that matrix times the vector. Okay, let me show you uh, what this thing does. So uh, this is a little video that goes with the, with the paper. And so this is what we did there, uh, extending, extended the use of exponential uh, integrators for problems that were not done before. That's what you have to do if you write a paper in computer graphics. You actually have to show that your methods work. You know, which is kind of unbelievable for people who do inverse problems. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, the new Hookian is a non-convex uh, uh, gives you non-convex energy. Okay, and we tried both mass springs and uh, this finite, finite element uh, approximation. And the, the point is that that uh, where is it right here? Uh, the point is, yeah, that uh, the implicit midpoint and backward Euler fully nonlinear, they have a similar cost more or less, whereas this uh, semi-implicit and our method 
also have a more or less similar cost, a smaller similar cost. Because the exponential, it turns out, uh, you, you can actually evaluate it explicitly. So you can see that this guy uh, is less energetic. Here it's even clearer, okay? So the, the exponential method follows the energetic implicit midpoint, but without solving nonlinear equations, whereas the semi-implicit, it's uh, lethargic. It's lethargic. Last, Tuesday, last Tuesday, I said that this is like what you do in the morning when you get up. I mean, you do the same things, but slowly. This is SI. So this, the interaction is uh, sort of uh, pulling this, uh, this is a blanket that you slept on in a tent, yeah? So, so you sort of get up in the morning and, and, and make it, uh, clean it. So again, the point is that this exponential method being cheaper still uh, reproduces results that are similar to the implicit midpoint. This is collision with the ball. So look at the, what happens to this uh, sheet after the collision. So again, fairly similar to implicit midpoint. This one is, uh, again, more lethargic. This here is, yeah, let's not talk about that. Okay, I think I'm done with this. Under, under the, uh, yes, there is. I don't remember exactly the, the model, to be honest, but uh, yes. Um, and, and you do have the damping, the natural damping. It's, it's there as well. And again, I don't have time to go into it. However, however, um, what if you actually want to produce uh, some, some, an object like that? So these guys, uh, what they wanted to, so this is a paper in, uh, from that, that uh, I, I was not part of uh, in 2017, and they have uh, some, some deformable object, and they want to tweak it in such a way that it will jump over a, a wall, okay? Uh, so here, you cannot generate, so you fabricate this thing. And you cannot uh, fabricate a thing like that based on some time step that you use in your simulation. Yeah. <laughs> it should not show, the time step should not show. In other words, you really should move from qualitative to quantitative, and this is where we come in. I have a, a, a video that they actually, maybe that will speak to some people here. So. Uh, let me quickly show that too. So that's, that's not a video that uh, is from a paper that, uh, that uh, I wrote. No, maybe I won't show it. I, I will show people who are interested. Uh, they have a nitty video uh, for this paper. So uh, what, I show, what I did show last uh, Tuesday, Tuesday t nine days ago, uh, was a, a simple analysis that applied to just one equation of the same sort, and uh, d and omega here are, uh, con are constant uh, for, for a sc scalar ODE, and uh, the point was that now let d, the exact d be zero, and uh, figure out from uh, the method if it introduces some d method that looks, that looks like this equation. And in fact, it turns out that uh, for backward Euler, which is the same as semi-implicit, uh, it divided by omega, the, the, uh, it, the curve looks like this, as a function of the step size tau times the frequency omega. Uh, so I, I will not go more into that because we did that already uh, uh, nine days ago. But 
here come these, uh, this, the, the paper I just showed you by, by uh, Chen, it's not the same Chen, uh, and uh, David Levin and uh, Motusik and uh, Kaufman. Uh, and what they said was, we are going to use one of those methods that are conservative, okay? So suddenly they are talking about structured uh, discretization, something that people in uh, computer graphics did not do before. Uh, I mean, they, they've not done, it's not the first, first paper that does it, but, but, but uh, it uh, shows a certain trend in computer graphics, getting closer to what we do like in, in geometric integration, for example. So uh, you can think of an energy conservation or like uh, the average vector field, if you ever heard of it, okay? Or uh, this, this method, uh, in fact, uh, bears uh, one of the major efforts about it, not, not they didn't invent it, but they showed some nice uh, properties for it, uh, is by Kane, uh, Marsden, Ortiz, and West, and Martin, uh, Marsden, uh, applied mathematician, very well-known applied mathematician, and West was a student at the time. Okay, so uh, for, for these methods, you don't have any, uh, any uh, artificial damping at all, okay? And they chose to use them in order to be able to actually obtain met, uh, uh, results that uh, are, do not depend on, uh, on your numerical method. Okay. Oh, just uh, the, yeah. This is all from the video, really all covered by the video. So, of course, then you will say, well, why did you waste our time with backward Euler now that we know something much better? Yeah. But in fact, uh, life is not as simple as this. Uh, why not just discard the uh, backward Euler and forget it? Yeah. Well, it? Because if you take a large step, as I mentioned, in fact, uh, then, uh, then those conservative methods, uh, you don't even know. First of all, how do you get it? It's a big question. But even if you got it, you don't, uh, you don't know what you got. I mean, it can be stable because uh, you are conserving energy, and energy often gives you a stability measure. But uh, you don't know how far you are from the, from the solution if you take a large step. And so, um, and so you can take large step, but not larger, I wrote here. Okay, so if you, have, if you want really large step, because uh, this thing here is much stiffer than my shirt, I mean, maybe it's a stiff jacket or something, um, then, uh, then your step has to be small and uh, you're back into problem. The exponential method also uh, loses charm, I wrote, when the stiffness is too high, it becomes expensive. And uh, so none of these methods, in fact, is sufficiently perfect for practical use. Uh, in such situations, you can try to reduce artificial damping by mixing methods. I'll say a few words about that. You can try to decouple fast and slow scales. So far, we've been successful in doing that only for very small, uh, simple problems, okay, but not realistic problems. And uh, when it comes to molecular dynamic simulation, <laughs> After 30 years of research, no one knows how to do it. Okay, so, yeah. Some of those problems uh, have a tendency to stick around and not uh, to be declared solved. Uh, you can just take implicit midpoint and BDF2, which is like, like backward Euler, but second order, uh, and mix them. And uh, theta is the mixing factor, and uh, in fact, you, you obtain uh, artificial damping curves like this as you move from the, the implicit midpoint closer and closer to the BDF2. So you can play with that. How much, I mean, try to control the amount of artificial damping. Yeah. And uh, you can actually also do this generalized alpha method, uh, and that in fact gives similar results. Not, not the same, but similar. The point of this entire exercise is that we have just seen a case study where the need to move from qualitative to quantitative has caused computer, the computer graphics community to get closer to our community. Or maybe I should say my community because I've been working a lot uh, in uh, geometric integration, symplectic methods and things like that. Okay. Now I'd like to, to talk about another Example, another case study. 
image and pr surface processing, and I would like to suggest that here is one where instead of them moving closer to us, maybe to us, us being this us, uh, I, I gave this talk also to an audience of mostly computer graphics people. Um, maybe it's time that we also should try to move closer to them, because maybe there are a few things that, uh, that uh, it's hard to think about that, but maybe still uh, they have some knowledge we don't, or we can improve ourselves by getting closer. Let's look at image and surfacing. Uh, this is the denoising an image. As, again, I showed this in the first talk I gave here. Uh, but I think that everybody has seen it before. Uh, it's a, a, the cameraman, uh, noisy, and we try to get rid of the noise, um, of the noising. You can try to do the same thing for a surface. So this is a tr triangle mesh that describes uh, the surface of a, of a, of a statue. But it's noisy, the, 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 the cues, the, the particles here, the nodes are noisy, and you want to remove, remove the, noise, the noise. It's not exactly the same problem, but somewhat similar. And here's something that appeared in all the lectures, I think, that we've seen in the past few weeks. Okay, so we want to minimize uh, the two norm, let's say, of f of u, I called this U M until now, but let's call it U now. Uh, and F of U, which is the uh, predictor, predict the prediction, uh, we like to find U, uh, such that F of U is not too far from data B, given data B that used to be called D until now, and suddenly there are B, sorry about that. Plus uh, beta times a, uh, R of u, R of u now is the integral over the domain that we are, the domain of the picture, for example, uh, of a function rho of the size of the gradient of u, okay? And uh, if you take a rho of s to be s square, that will be the L2 norm on the gradient inside the, the integral here. If you take uh, rho of s to be s, this is uh, anisotropic diffusion, otherwise known as total variation. And uh, you can take a combination of these two because, as uh, some Woolley said, uh, you will have a problem with total variation there, you know, when, well, there it is. I took the, uh, I took the liberty to reproduce the picture that was there before, exactly where it was before, yeah. So uh, the point, however, is uh, that what we did uh, was slightly different than, uh, instead of ad adding something to under the square root, uh, we switch from L1 to L2. And uh, this is called the uh, Huber, uh, Huber switching, uh, very popular nowadays. Uh, and so the switch is at a point, some point gamma, and uh, the, our paper was about how to choose gamma, how to choose the switching point between the two. But the, but the purpose is exactly the same as in the previous lecture, namely to smooth this sort of discontinu uh, lower continuity. Huge amount of work followed. Uh, Perona and Malik was a paper from 90. There's actually some people used this already in, in the 70s, by the way, but uh, never mind them. And uh, the famous uh, Rudin Ocean Fatemi that opened up the field. Uh, Weikert uh, work, uh, has a book from 88 on uh, multi scale, uh, something or another. Tony Chan and uh, other people from uh, UCLA. Uh, uh, other people, these are papers from computer graphics that used uh, on, 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 this is on surface, on surfaces. Yeah. Okay. What's there to say? But now I'm going to ask anyway, a terrible question. Is this always the right thing to do? Even though everybody does it. So when I ask this, usually there are two reactions. One, the reaction from uh, people who are from the applied math and numerical side is uh, what else is there to do? And the reaction from, from uh, top people in computer graphics is why would you ever want to use that? It's slightly different. And, uh, and uh, I'd like to, therefore, 
uh, suggest the following. This is my contribution, in fact, in this, uh, on this topic. I think that there are some things here that you have to be careful about, okay? First of all, the first thing that people do, I, I, I saw two talks in conferences uh, uh, in the re recent months, where uh, the, person, the, the, the speaker, who, by the way, in both cases, they were excellent people, my, some of my favorite, uh, uh, said, uh, first of all, it has to work in Banach space. So why does it have to work in Banach space? I mean, it's not obvious here. Uh, you're looking at a, at, at, at a picture, you know, on pixels. It's Rn, and you want to apply a transformation from Rn to Rn. Why do you first of all have, have to go to a, a, a space, an infinite dimensional space, change things in the infinite dim dimensional space, and come back to, this, this, to the same discrete space? I'm not saying not, do, not to do it. I'm not saying don't do it. I am saying it should be justified. It's not an axiom. By the way, I did it myself in several of uh, the talks that I gave uh, during these two weeks and the paper that George and I wrote. For example, we did this and so on. It's not that I'm against it. I'm suggesting, however, that it should be justified. It cannot be taken as something that you start with and then you continue. And the second thing is even worse, I, in my view. This is global. This is global. This is integral of the, the entire domain, okay? So that means that so you go, uh, uh, to the beach with, uh, with your special uh, friend, and you take a selfie, and uh, you look at the picture, and now the, your special friend and the sand weigh the same in this, in this penalty. That's not where you want to be. That's not what Photoshop is about. There is reason why we do it anyway. <laughs> so the advantage is that you can often obtain a more solid theoretical backing. Uh, one thing is you can prove more theorems, but it's not only that. It's also that you have an idea of what you're doing. A much better sort of uh, uh, it's, it's better grounded uh, using such a such a uh, such a uh, a prior. Okay, but the disadvantage is it may be outperformed by um, more brute force techniques especially if the data fitting here is high quality, of high quality data. If you have some MRI image, mm, uh, it doesn't matter so much. You, you are not going to see the difference, or the, the, the effect of using that, and therefore use it because it gives you the advantage of structure, okay? But uh, not to mention theory. But uh, if uh, B is a, high, uh, is, 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 a, is a good picture, the data, data comes from a good picture, noise level is low, uh, but you're missing part of it or something, for instance. And if f of u is simple, okay, then you have to be careful. I mean, it's not to be careful. You actually may lose something by using this. So, uh, so when the advantages outweighs the disadvantages, this is where you want to use it, as opposed to always. For example, if f of u itself contains differential terms, and of course the fact that you're using also differential terms in the uh, uh, prior, it's not going to give you, uh, it's not going to dis detract from the, uh, from the quality of the result, okay? Uh, but suppose that you don't have a differential operator there. Still, there are situations where you want to use it. For example, if f of u or b or the data b are not of high quality. Again, then there will be nothing to lose. Okay. So, for example, not just deconvolution, but blind deconvolution. Uh, so, you, so, yeah, blind deconvolution, it's kind of semi-blind. Uh, so you have, uh, you don't know the kernel of the deconvolution, but you know, um, you have some, uh, you're looking for some parameters. You want to identify parameters in your kernel, okay? Once you start doing that, uh, taking that, uh, uh, this particular prior that I mentioned before, I call it the paradigm, uh, is not going to make things worse. 
Okay, so you're not losing anything. Again, you gain structure. I mean, because you, you, you are, when you use total variation, for example, as was mentioned here several times, uh, you actually are saying, oh, I know that it should be bulky or something like that. Or I know it should be smooth. Uh, you're introducing information this way. Uh, but the question is whether it's too uh, coarse information. There, there are, uh, there's a sequence of papers by Haida and other people in Heidrich uh, in computer graphics where they have exactly that situation. They, use blind, they, they do blind convolution, and it's a time of flight data. The data are not high quality, uh, and they use, it's, I mean, what they do is far less simple than what's written here, but of this sort. The other thing is uh, you can have, uh, you, I mean, the purpose could be uh, we want to generate some primitives. And this is a paper by the Goish and the Goish, the Goish. He's actually Brazilian, I think. Uh, Fernando de Goish, he worked for Pixar. I don't know if anybody has heard of him. I, I saw him give a talk and uh, the sota a sotaki for the Brazil, not, no, not the Portugal. <laughs> um, that James is Canadian that I know. And they are both working at Pixar, and uh, Doug is also a uh, professor in uh, Stanford. So what they did was they, uh, they solved such a problem, not exactly, not exactly this, but something like that. And they called, uh, f uh, um, so you have a differential equation, and you can look for uh, fundamental solutions. And they called those fundamental solutions Kelvinlets. I don't know why. Uh, not wavelets, not shearlets, but Kelvin lets, and they use that in order to, so you have a picture and you want to increase the smile or something, so they use that for this kind of operations, graphics operations. It's a really cute paper uh, that appears in SIGGRAPH uh, uh, Proceedings, uh, which is a volume of, uh, of ACM uh, uh, journal on transaction of computer graphics. So even those guys use this, even though two of the most important people in the community said exactly what I just told you. I mean, they say, why do you want to use it at all? Not true. You do, if you have a good reason for it. Okay. Now I want to show you two examples where you don't, or where you have an advantage of not doing it. So again, when I show you examples like that, uh, it's easiest, easiest for me to talk about the work that I've been uh, doing. Uh, so this is the, the, the denoising in, uh, of the triangle meshes. You can actually argue that you don't want to know how to denoise triangle meshes, but let's assume you do. Let's assume that this is a, a reasonable problem to look at, and it has been looked at uh, by many people. Uh, so you have this, and you want to denoise it in such, such a way as to obtain that. And the, uh, there's a few. The, ch the challenge here is that you want to retain the, the edges the sharp edges. Here, the challenge is different. You have this bunny, and it's in error, and what you want is to denoise it without losing the fur. <laughs> because if you just smooth it, then the fur will be gone. You have texture. The, the actual, the, the, the exact uh, bunny has texture, and you don't want to lose that. That's the question. How do you remove the noise without m removing the texture? So uh, here's some literature in image processing, and in particular, these papers. This is by Tadmor Neza, Neza and Veze, and this one is uh, by Osher, I think Berger, and uh, Goldfarb, and two others. Uh, and uh, both of them use a theorem, and I forgot to look it up before, uh, before coming here. I believe it's by, by uh, Mayer. Uh, of a decomposition of, bound, uh, of, of BV space. Anybody knows this? Uh, so you d uh, decomposition to uh, different bands of frequencies. And so basically what they did was to take the, sim the, the courses, which is just total variation. Total variation certainly does not preserve uh, stru uh, um, texture. It flattens everything. Uh, and then you add a band of frequencies, do it again, a band of frequencies, do it just edit a bunch at a time, and somehow magically you stop before you start uh, fitting noise. Okay, so that's uh, in two words of what they did. I saw these papers and I said to Hui Huang, who was my student at the time, let's do the same thing for triangle meshes. And just like that, we get a paper. 
several months later, <laughs> uh, we found out that nothing worked. We could not extend this. We just could not extend it for triangle meshes. And there are some reasons. The extension is not straight. I mean, there's no separation between mesh locations and the, in the intensity height. I mean, you have uh, points, like, like, like here. You have points, and if the, when there is noise, they are all in error. So the position and value are all one. Yeah, so there's no separation between uh, position and value. Uh, in the second lecture I gave here, I mentioned this. Uh, and the mesh is not regular. Uh, there is volume shrinkage. You can shrink the bunny if you just smooth it. Yeah? And you don't want to shrink it. Uh, and as I said, what we eventually came up with, the only thing that remained out of these papers was this idea of introducing, reintroducing uh, uh, frequency bands one at a time. That's the only re thing that remained. Okay. In particular, um, so what you want to do, let me show the bunny again. Let's say that you want to denoise here. It turns out that the key, a key thing to do is to figure out the norm. Let's say that we have a node here, okay, that we want to denoise. Uh, so the, a key thing to do is to look for the normal and denoise in the normal direction. Okay. So how do you look for the normal? Uh, the normal, will, uh, so, so it's a triangle mesh. So uh, for this node, you have a bunch of triangles that touch it. Yeah. So. in three dimensions, in three dimensions. Yeah. So we are here and, and, and you have those. So for each of these triangles, you can fi figure out the normal. Yeah, and then you, know, you average them somehow and obtain uh, a normal at the point. The point, however, is that these are all nearby triangles. I mean, you don't use, an, uh, you don't use a point from here to find the normal there, you see? So this is not the same as the integral of all of omega. It's really local. Crucial issue, crucial reason why it did not work to just uh, extend the, the, the image processing work. Okay. Local. So, uh, so you look at the neighborhood, the local neighborhood, okay, all the neighbors of Q of your QI, and then uh, find the normal from that. And then here is the iteration, uh, the current value, the current noisy value. Uh, you you uh, compute a correction plus some uh, fidelity to ori the original data, okay? And you do it for each node. And the way that this correction is chosen is a weighted average of the edges, but such that it's all in the normal direction. That's the key. So the correction is in the normal direction for, that, for each of the nodes, okay? And uh, there, there is this magic here that I will not go through, but, uh, but uh, uh, how to choose those, uh, weight, those weights G here inside, okay? Lambda I equals zero. On Tuesday, nine days ago, I showed an angel with noise and then an angel without a noise. Maybe some of you remember it. Uh, that is the algorithm that was used for that. Just this. You visit each node once, no PTEs. You just visit each node once, you do a little bit of something, and that's it. So it's optimal order, because you must visit each node. So it's optimal complexity, okay? And it's fast, and it says less than 20 lines of MATLAB. If you have now, the bunny has uh, uh, texture, then what we do, you know, you, we may over smooth the bunny. So what we do is we don't stop the iteration. We now, once we iterate it, we do it again. Uh, and there's a psi to the power k here. Psi is one half, for instance. And so the smoothing correction is taken less and less. And therefore, the fidelity to the data becomes more and more important. So we reintroduce fidelity to the data, okay, until uh, we feel that, uh, that we are over. Uh, there's a, there's, it's not so trivial, as I'm saying, there are some there's some magic here, but, but it is all very simple to calculate and uh, very direct and very fast, and it works. So there is, once again, the Igea is the name of the statue uh, with noise, and here is our result without the noise. 
opti it's not just optimal complexity, it is, uh, what is it? Four, iter four iterations and 13 seconds in a computer from 12, year 12 years ago. And 135,000 vertices. It's not a small problem. So you see, there are sometimes reasons not to look at the paradigm. That is the point. Another example coming, uh, can I? So here is a dish broken. So it's a picture of a dish, broken dish. I don't have the dish. And uh, we want to put it together. And that's the result of our effort. Okay. Um, and so what do you, how do you do that? So y you want to register the pieces. But it's not a registration alone. It is tele-registration because these guys are not close to one another. Okay, uh, so there's a piece missing here completely in, in the middle as well. So what we do is uh, we do what we do is that we attempt to find a curve matching a curve from an adjacent piece, right? So so we look, for example, here there's a salient feature, okay, and we look at the salient feature which ends uh, with the boundary of this piece, uh, not like this. This guy is of no interest because it's inside the piece. I cannot use it to match the, the, another piece. Yeah. But if I find this curve, and if I, if I find this curve, and then I can try to bridge them, bridge, bridge between them. Yeah. Likewise, inside here, these guys can be extended somehow and matched with these guys. Okay. So we look for salient features. Of course, uh, using the eye is very simple to see them. But now you have to sort of have an algorithm that finds them. Total variation comes to mind. Okay. Um, and uh, so once we have that, then the, the next stage is to uh, find, um, uh, to, to, to uh, put them all together in an ambient vector field and then transform uh, each piece so the salient, uh, cur the salient kill curves line up. And then uh, that sort of uh, bridging, bridging curves. And once we've done that, uh, if there are holes, we do something called data completion based on synth uh, synthesis, based data uh, structure driven synthesis, and then in the end, uh, um, uh, in painting, which says here standard in painting tools. This was the <laughs> these, these papers are older than some of the papers of our community on in, on, on data on in painting. So uh, again, a difference in uh, communities that one of them thinks that this is a problem is solved and the other one is still solving it. Um, when uh, I saw this problem, I said to Hui, you had all these, you know, you, you, you had all these, you had a code for this thing. Why don't you use it in order to, to do, to find silent curves? It's total variation. But it doesn't work so well. Again, because it, the total variation is over the entire domain, and this is spe uh, special. You can actually do a better job if you take into account local situations. And that's what we did with a code from, um, by Daddy Lishinsky from um, another work with uh, three other people. Here's a cute result. Uh, so you have this uh, picture of a statue, but uh, some of it is, uh, is uh, behind the plant. You don't want the plant. Uh, so the user says, I don't want this piece. Okay. Wipe the plant away. Uh, but now, of course, that creates a hole here. Okay. So what we do is we take a piece of, of, the, leg, of the part uh, by the leg okay, and uh, tailor register it here. Okay. So this thing is actually from here. Okay and do a completion like that. Uh, do you see that this is higher quality than uh, rotating MRI picture? Uh, you know, so, so, so there's a difference here. There are some things that they don't know how to do. They do know how to do that. Yeah. The other side of it, however, I'll admit, as I usually admit when the, the, uh, the paper is mine, uh, uh, that uh, you need hand holding. For this example, you need hand holding. You actually tell it what to do, the algorithm what to do, and so on. Nonetheless, I mean, the quality of such a result is a different, uh, in different league, I would say, than what we are used to.
here's the picture that started the project. Uh, this, this, is the, this is the original. It's just a, uh, unlike this, it's, it's not, it's not uh, fabricated. This is a, uh, <coughs> this is a, a picture from uh, Bante Chmar, which is, a, which is an archaeological uh, site uh, in the jungles of Cambodia, uh, close to the Thai border. And this was taken by my wife, Nurit. And uh, I think that the camera was a Nikon D800. And, um, and uh, the age of, the, of, the, uh, uh, of, of this thing is about 900 years. It's the same as Angkor. But the difference is Angkor is huge and beautiful and a uh, million people there at any time. Whereas this one is small and we were the only ones in the entire park. You know, if you know, I mean, Angkor, you, you have to be Angelina Jolie to be there alone uh, in, you know, when she makes a movie and you see only what the camera wants you to see. Yeah. So, uh, so the point is that you don't just want to do in-painting here, you want to align the spears here, for example, and you want to, uh, this guy is all over the place, you want to sort of make sense out of it, you know, of, the, of, of this part. And this is the result, okay, so this actually, now the, the, this, uh, this part of the relief uh, looks reasonable, and likewise the spears. So the blocks were moved in order to generate the picture. It's not just the in-paint. Only then you do the in-paint. Uh, uh, let, let me continue to tell the story here. This, this uh, example does not appear in our paper because my colleagues uh, decided that it's not good enough. It's not uh, striking enough, I guess I should say. It's not striking enough. It's, it's not as striking as this. Yeah? And I said, come on, guys, I mean, this is real. This is, this is, this is uh, you know, an archaeological example. Uh, and they said, okay, you must have archaeological example. Let's go to the uh, Egyptian tombs because they've been around for 3,500 years, not 900, and so the blocks move more, and so you can see more. <laughs> you, you know, it's more of a challenge, and that's what we did. Uh, but I, f I said, come on, you know, nobody has been here and so on. It's somewhere in the middle of nowhere. It looks like a novel just to have it. Uh, that didn't work. Because uh, you have to realize that, uh, of course, they were right, uh, you know, in terms of computer graphics, because, uh, because it's not teleregistration. You just move the blocks uh, in a kind of a straightforward way. In that sense, the challenge is smaller. The reason why I mentioned the camera that uh, my wife used is because it has uh, 32 megapixels. So it's 32 times more than the 1,000 by 1,000 pixels that, that Samuri just mentioned before. And so are you sure you really want to introduce differential terms in there and then solve the whole thing on a 32 million by 32 million grid? Uh, there can be a big difference there. So, um, right on time. Uh, incorporate more mathematically sound techniques into methods and algorithms in computer graphics and image processing. That is, uh, maybe I didn't say it, but uh, 15 or 20 years ago, it was difficult to talk sometimes with, with people from that community. Now it's much easier. Uh, there are significant practical advantages gained uh, in visual computing using physics-based simulations, data-driven model calibration, and so on. And, uh, again, this is uh, an advance, advance of, the, of recent years. Um, and in fact, we may occasionally use math to obtain solid justification of algorithms that otherwise look like we do this, and then we do that, and, and so on. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully we are going to bridge the gap between qualitative and quantitative. It is still, it is already done, but uh, the fabricated models are all very simple. However, do not get swayed by sheer mathematical prowess. I mean, un unless this is the only thing that interests you. <laughs> but we're not talking about that. This is not, that's nothing to do with the interface between the community. Uh, and watch out for situations where the gap between physics and physics-based is too wide. Uh, for instance, they all 
like I did in the example, they all set the viscosity to zero and things like that uh, for good reasons so they can explain it over coffee. And uh, insisting on solving differential equations or satisfied mathematical topology theorems, I forgot to mention that uh, some of the efforts for, uh, for denoising triangles involve uh, differential topology uh, and they don't work as well as our 50-line uh, code. And um, uh, that may lead to inferior algorithms, actually. So sometimes the, the more sophisticated, sophisticated mathematics may even lead to inferior algorithms if you're not careful, if you don't concentrate on the important uh, aspects of the problem. I'm done. Okay, any questions or remarks? So, if this is not the case, let's thank Professor Uyashar again for this nice course.